supposed to be really cold. Like, so like negative four or negative five. That's without wind chill. So, it's supposed to be even colder Saturday. I'm tired of drug delays. So, I'd like to uh, get some teaching done. So, it just makes a two-day test turn into a four-day test, and it's just very frustrating. So, but we're supposed to start calculus test tomorrow. So, pre-cal yeah. we're done, but we're behind because we really were supposed to start our test on Monday, and then it got pushed back to Tuesday from two hour delays last week, and then because of the two hour delays this week, we couldn't get the test in to do test corrections until tomorrow, so really two, two days behind. Two, one day behind from where I planned from this week, but from where I planned from last week, I'm two days behind. So, I'm just stressed. All right, so here's the, the big idea for today. There's a lot of notes in this, but it's really just trying to get you to see why do inverse trig functions have a restricted domain and range? Because, remember, to have an inverse, your function must pass the horizontal line test. Do you remember that? Because if it passes the horizontal line test, when you switch the x's and y's, that means it'll pass the vertical line test. Does sine or cosine or any trig function, is it ever going to pass the horizontal line test? <coughs> because it, it repeats itself, right? By definition, trig functions are periodic. They repeat themselves. So what we have to do, or what math people did, is they picked, what if we look at just one section? So what if we just look for negative pi halves to pi halves on this graph? So negative pi halves would be like right here to pi halves would be right here. What if you just look at this restricted part of sine? Does that pass the horizontal line test? Yes, and there's other reasons why they pick this, because you might think, why wouldn't they pick other regions of the graph? Because you could pick a lot of regions. But there's kind of rules for the restricted domain. It has to be either always increasing or always decreasing. They call that monotonic. This is increasing the whole time. Um, it covers the entire range of sine. It goes from negative 1 to 1, so that has to be important. And most importantly, it has to pass the vertical and the horizontal line test, and it does. We've done stuff like this before. We've talked about, like, for x squared, for x squared to have a domain, you have to either pick the positive half or the negative half, because otherwise a sideways parabola doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So this is not really a brand new concept. But the big idea that I want you to realize is that inverse sine can only have answers between negative pi halves and pi halves. So let's talk about the notation of this. The notation, if we look at the restricted domain of negative pi halves and pi halves, we would say that the inverse of y equals sine of x can be written two ways. The way that we've kind of seen it before. Have we done inverse sine on our calculator before? We have, haven't we? In here? Uh, this is the button on our calculator, and we know if we're trying to solve for an angle, then we use that inverse button, and that's what negative one power means in terms of math. It means inverse. But you can also write it as arc sine of x, and that just means um, the arc whose sine is x. So arc sine and inverse sine both mean the same thing, which means the angle or the arc whose sine is x. So remember inverses, domain and range switch. So think about this. When we talk about sine, what is what are the x values normally? Like what do we pick for x? Zero, sine, sine. We pick angles, right? So normally for sine, we put in angles, right? The domain are the angles: zero, pi halves, pi, three pi halves, seven pi fourths, whatever we want to get. And the output, the y, we get out what? numbers is kind of a vague answer, right? We get out values, right? We get out the values from our unit circle or from our triangle. So I'm going to put, we put in angles, we get out the values from the unit circle. But the definition of an inverse is we're going to switch those. So now think about, either way, these are the same thing, so I'm going to write this kind of in the middle. If we switch the domain and range, now x is going to be what the range was over there, right? So now we're going to say, we put in the values, and our answer now, our y values, we get out the angles. Your 
we're never going to have to graph these, but we're going to look at some graphs just so, again, you can kind of see it, see the restricted range, but then you're just going to have to memorize the restricted ranges. So, again, there's kind of a lot of notes today, um, but we're going to kind of summarize at the end of this is the part you need to know, but I feel like it's, I like to spend this time on it because I really want you to see why it's restricted. But the big thing is you've got to evaluate these. So, let's think about this. All right, this is just one more. I sure have a lot of writing on this. Uh, the definition of inverse sine function, y equals arc sine of x, if and only if sine of y equals x. And again, notice what I did here. I just switched the x's and y's. This is the part you should probably like start around it. And maybe we'll write that out again in a minute. For arc sine, the domain are the values, right? My domain is from negative 1 to 1. My range is from negative pi halves to pi halves. Without a calculator, I expect that you can answer questions like this. So the big part of today is understanding like what question do you ask yourself. If I ask you to evaluate arc sine of zero, it's like saying the sine of what angle equals zero. Because this is the value now. Your answer is the angle. So can you tell me what angle has a sine of zero? Zero and pi and two pi and three pi and four pi and five pi, right? All those numbers. But when we're talking about inverses, you're never going to give me more than one answer because of right here. You can only give me answers between negative pi halves and pi halves. So let me ask the question again. What is the only angle that has a sine of zero that's in between negative pi halves and pi halves? Zero. Does that make sense? People really struggle with the idea of negative pi halves. Um, okay, let's do this one and then we'll, I'll draw a picture here. Yeah, yeah, so if we're talking about our unit circle, this is zero, so this up here is pi halves. Normally, going positively, we think about this as 3 pi halves, but I want to go from negative pi halves through pi halves. So we're going to measure backwards here. So instead of calling that 3 pi halves, we're going to call it negative pi halves. So when you give me answers, they have to be the negative angles. So instead of saying 5 pi thirds, can I say that's negative pi thirds? And instead of saying that's what, 7 pi fourths? That would be negative pi fourths. And if I go backwards this way, that would be negative pi sixths. And then we'd have our positive angles, pi sixths, pi fourths, pi thirds. That would be going from negative pi halves around the pi halves. So you have to go through zero there. So thinking about that, now you can answer this. And again, sine inverse is the same as arc sine. We just took a test in pre-cal over this, and I had some kids say, I didn't know that those were the same thing. Go out to the test. That's what it's called. So what's this saying? This is saying what angle has a sine of negative square root of 2 over 2 in between negative pi halves and pi halves? Negative pi fourths is the answer. And again, why is it negative pi fourths? Because that's the only angle in between here that you're allowed to give me. So you can't say 7 pi fourths. You can't say 3 pi fourths. There's only one angle that you can give me. And so that's the big part that you have to memorize. What about if I gave you something like this? What angle has a sine of 2.5? Nick says nothing. Because why? Right? Can't get bigger than 1 or smaller than negative 1. If you did this on your calculator, it would say domain error. Uh, I want you to be able to do it without a calculator. And no, I can't have a sign bigger than 1, um, so I'm going to say undefined. Or you could say the empty set. Okay, so this is the big idea today. I want to spend a couple minutes, a few minutes, talking about the restrictions for inverse cosine and inverse tangent and the graphs of what they look like. Um, I gave you the graphs of two of them, but I'm going to make this graph this first one here. So let's graph arc sine of x just so that you can kind of see what's happening as we switch it. Again, you're never going to have to graph these on a test. Uh, I just think it's helpful in understanding the restrictions. So, think of 
about um, what we know x is, right? x is the values now. Or the values. And we know we're stuck between negative 1 and 1. Yes? And we know the range we're stuck between negative pi halves and pi halves. So what I think is the weirdest about graphing inverse trig functions is when we label our graph over here, the x-axis is going to go from negative 1 to 1, and the y-axis is going to go from negative pi halves to pi halves, and it's just kind of weird to think about graphing angles on the y-axis, in my opinion. What do I know? Let's graph what we know. We know at negative 1, right, what angle has a sign of negative 1? Well, we know it's negative pi halves. And at angle 1, or at 1, we know the angle is pi. What else could we pick for x? 0 would be a great choice. What angle has a sign of 0 in between negative pi halves and pi halves? 0, so I get this nice point here. If you didn't know any better, you might just make a straight line there. That would be very bad. It kind of works either way you want here. But what other values do we know or what other angles do we want to work out? Um, we could work backwards here. What if I picked pi fourths? That would be my y value. What x value would I get? What, uh, what would the sign of pi fourths be? I think it's like 0 0.707. I might have a weird memorization of radical 0 over 2. Which means, what would that be? This would be like 0.5, so 0.7, roughly about like that. And could I do the negative one also? Negative pi fourths would just be like negative 0.7071. Maybe like that. Curvy. We could have picked the one that gave us one half, but you know, whatever. Let's see how this kind of goes like this. Kind of almost like a cubic function. But very importantly, there are no arrows on this. Like it stops. The only answers you can give me for arc sine are stuck between negative pi halves and pi halves. And so that's what you have to memorize. The only x values you can ever use are between negative 1 and 1. We don't have many graphs that we deal with in math that are so closed on their domain and range, but the inverse trig functions are closed on both domain and range. So what I want to do is instead of spending time and making you graph the other ones, I just want to give you the graphs of the other ones and talk about their restricted domains and ranges so you know what answers you can give me. And then that's it. All right, so this will go really fast now. So if we talk about cosine, also fails the horizontal line test. But if we look for where it's decreasing on the whole interval and it covers the entire domain and range and um, passes the horizontal line test, we can look at values from 0 to pi. And so notice this one is the, um, the y-axis only goes from 0 to pi. The x-axis goes from negative 1 to 1. And that's what our cosine looks like. Um, so what you need to know is you are restricted, let's just write here, for arc cosine, the domain is from negative 1 to 1, the range is restricted from 0 to pi. And again, you can write it as inverse cosine, like the button on your calculator, or arc cosine means the same thing, so just be aware that those are the same. So we're going to do some questions at the end here, and you can only give me answers between 0 and 1. And then the only other one we deal with is arc tangent. So I don't know why that says tangent twice, right? Like that's, that's unnecessary. Yes?
Tangent has some asymptotes because tangent's undefined uh, because it's uh, what sine over cosine. So every time there's an asymptote, like uh, I don't know, I don't know why don't we graph tangent in here? Because the book didn't make it. Tangent looks like this, right? So like negative pi halves to pi halves. Tangent kind of looks like a cubic function because there's these asymptotes here, and then. At like three pi halves, there's another asymptote, and it just repeats itself. That same little pattern. So notice, I think this is the easiest one to visualize. Inverse tangent just takes that and flips it, and so now we are restricted between that asymptote, negative pi halves and pi halves, uh, and the domain uh, is all real numbers because this goes on forever this way. So if we flip it, it's going to go on forever. So for inverse tangent or arc tangent, you don't really need to know what it looks like, but you need to know that the domain is all real numbers because it goes on forever in both directions. Tangent can be bigger than one and less than negative one. And the range is stuck between the two asymptotes, just like uh, the range for inverse sine is negative pi halves and pi halves. So what you need to know is really on the next slide, okay? I'm, I'm kind of summarizing all this on the next slide so you don't have to go back through all these pages. But when we're evaluating these without a calculator, you have to know the restricted domain ranges, and if you know that, you never have to think about the graph, you never have to think about uh, that kind of stuff, you just have to memorize these restricted domain ranges. So, let's just write them out for sine, cosine, and tangent. This would be the page, if you're going to do anything to study, this would be the page that you study. So we're going to do the domain for each of these, and the range for each of these. Why don't I just start with this page as the notes, because I like to see why it's restricted, maybe? I don't know. What about these? Do you understand why it's restricted? It's easier to memorize it. Helps me if I understand why it happens. Uh, so that on the test, if you forget the memorization, then you can think through it. And remember that it switches. So on sine and cosine, remember that sine and cosine are never bigger than one, fall to negative one. So we're switching the domain range. So that's why the domain of arc sine and arc cosine is negative one to one. If you graph tangent, it goes forever in both directions. So normally the range is all real numbers. We're switching it. So the domain of arc tangent is negative infinity to infinity. That just means if I give you a value bigger than one or smaller than negative one on sine and cosine, that's where it's undefined. Tangent will never be undefined in terms of I can give you any x value and you can always give me an angle that works. It might be ugly. The ranges are the parts you need to know without a calculator. Sine and tangent are the same. They are stuck between negative pi halves and pi halves. And then cosine um, has to cover the two quadrants where it's positive and negative, so that's why it's zero and pi. And that's why sine and tangent are uh, negative pi half to pi half, because one of those quadrants gives you negative values and one of them gives you positive. And they're, right, they're next to each other. You couldn't jump from quadrant one to quadrant three. So today on your homework, all you're doing are questions like we did already and questions like this just to practice finding the values, and it's a good little review of your unit circle uh, values. You have to remember what this means, right? If I say find the arc tan of the square root of 3, I'm asking you, right, this is like the brain questions that you should be asking yourself. What is my interval I'm allowed to give answers in? Well, I'm only allowed to give answers between negative pi halves and pi halves. And then what does this mean? This is like saying what angle has a tangent of the square root of 3. You're stuck between negative pi halves and pi halves. If tangent is positive, are you going to be down in the negative angles or are you going to be up in the positive angles? It's got to be positive. Tangent is positive up here. And if it's square root of 3, I know it's one of those uh, pi thirds or pi sixths, right? So don't miss it because you just guess. This is 1 half square root of 3 over 2. This is square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. Tangent is what? 
y over x. So it'd be by thirds because y has to be on top, right? So square root over 1. So the answers on your homework today don't really require you to do a lot of work. If you know your unit circle is kind of just working it out, you want to draw the figure each time you can. But the answer is just the angle restricted between that uh, restricted range value. That was just the questions you should ask no, yourself to answer that question. I didn't put the questions on this, but you can still ask yourself that. If I said find arc cosine of negative one half, I think it's helpful to think about where's your answer allowed to be first, and what is the restricted range for arc cosine. So you should only give me answers between zero and pi. And then the other thing you just have to get used to is when they give you arc cosine or inverse cosine, your answer is supposed to be the angle. So this is like saying what angle has a cosine of negative one half. And again, I always get down to the quadrant very easily. If I'm stuck between zero and pi and the cosine is negative, what quadrant do I have to be in? It's got to be over here, right? Don't give me an answer in quadrant one because cosine is not negative in quadrant one. And then it's just, do you know where cosine is negative one half? That one, right? Which is two pi thirds. See how you never get away from the unit circle in this class? It always comes back to it. Go about the last one. Cosine is x. So at zero, remember that order pair is one zero. Zero up here. So uh, yeah, zero would be the answer. Your calculator does do these for you, which means if this shows up on a quiz or a test, you're not going to be allowed to use the calculator. Uh, what if it's not a nice angle? So that's what we have used our calculator before, and I just put a couple on here just to remind you that you can type this in your calculator. Whatever mode you're in your calculator on will be the answer that it gives you. So like if you're in degree mode, it'll give you what degree has that cosine value. If you're in radian mode, it'll give it to you in radian. And they would ask you which one. But like you can just type, I would do degree mode first. What angle has a cosine of negative 0.7? I don't know. I can tell you it's going to be in quadrant 2, though, based on the restricted range, and it's negative. So I can just type in my calculator cosine of negative 0.7. And I get 134.4 degrees. And that's a reasonable answer. It's in quadrant two. Or if you were in radian mode, that would be like 2.35 radians. Directions. I just changed the radians, yes. Three, four, six, two, and degree mode would be four, two, seven, zero oh, degree. Bobby, did you have a question? Uh, I got zero. I thought it was Did your calculator give you positive? That's why I, I thought I was wrong. I thought I realized that it was And if you remember when we actually did these before and we had to give answers between zero and two pi. When we did inverse sine and inverse tangent on our calculator, it gives you negative angles if you're in, like if it's negative, it gives you the angles in the restricted range. So like your calculator knows that inverse sine is stuck between negative pi halves and pi halves, and it gives your answer like that. So you never have to think about it, like your calculator does the right thing. Uh, and so on for inverse 0.31. So this one is 18.0592 degrees, and in radians, 0.3152. And again, sine is positive in quadrant one from negative five to five halves, so it makes sense that that should be in quadrant one. Uh, we've used our calculator before, so I don't know that there's a lot of calculator stuff uh, on your test day, to, on your homework today. Tomorrow we're going to do, remember, I think you asked about this, Jake, once. Of when are we going to do the stuff where you have the X's and you draw the triangle with X's? Didn't you ask about that? 
I don't know. But anyway, you asked about it, I believe, this year. Maybe Nick did. That's what we get to do tomorrow, which is the other stuff that we do from the chapter. I'm just giving you one through six today, but just like the lovely little picture that you made up there for me, each one has more than one part. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that part. Oh my gosh, I know. the exact value, so there's not much to write down. You mean to just number them all like 1, 2, 3, 4, not like 1A, 1B, 1C? Makes it seem like a lot more problems, but... This will be good. You should write your homework problems out anyway. You guys never do. Yeah. The good news is you can just write the answers after this. Like, after you write these down, you don't have to have a lot of room for your work if you have a unit circle drawn somewhere. I feel like there's, like, every possible answer is going to be on here. <laughs> we'll see if I get tired of writing. Part. Oh no, wait, that's wrong. That's the one I was like, that's the same question. Yes, Bobby. Negative one half. Okay, we'll be done. I just had to scroll down and Bobby's still writing, so. Thank you. 